Welcome to this virtual class on the topographic anatomy of the posterior thigh, as well as the popliteal fossa. This is part of the lecture series that uh, I'm doing on the topographic anatomy of the lower limb. It's just the second one. The first one we looked at topographic anatomy of the gluteal region, and now we are looking at topographic anatomy of the thigh. However, the topographic anatomy of the thigh is a bit long, so I've chosen to do it in two parts. In this first part, we are just focusing on the posterior thigh and popliteal fossa, but of course, we'll also highlight some of the concepts of how the thigh is divided into compartments. Then second part, we look at now the other compartments of the thigh. After that, we'll also have other lectures still on topographic anatomy of the lower limb as displayed there. Just to bring you to speed, remember that the lower limb has various segments. We have the gluteal region, which we've already studied. We have the thigh, which we are now studying. So this is the one we're going to do in two parts. We also have the leg and the foot. And of course, between them, we also have some joints like hip joint, knee joint, ankle joint, which you'll also study in this lecture series at another time. So for this particular lecture on topographic anatomy of the posterior thigh and popliteal fossa, we are going to do the following. First, we'll describe the relevant osteology that we need to understand as we look at the anatomy of the thigh and especially posterior thigh and popliteal fossa. After that, we look at the sensory innervation of the skin of the posterior thigh. Then we will look into how the thigh is divided into the three osteofascial compartments. We can just call the three muscular compartments of the thigh. So we'll see how that division takes place. After that, we are going to see the contents of the posterior thigh compartment. Next, we look at the neurovascular structures within the posterior thigh. Importantly, we look at the sciatic nerve and we look at what we call longitudinal anastomosis. We will finish with the popliteal fossa, which is a potential space behind the knee joint. Here we are going to just look at the boundaries, contents, and clinical importance of the popliteal fossa. So let's begin with the first agenda where we are going to look at the relevant osteology We'll focus on that one of the pelvic bone that is relevant for posterior thigh anatomy and also of the femur that is relevant for posterior thigh anatomy. Let's start with the osteology of the pelvic bone that we need to know. We had already talked about pelvic bone when you looked at the gluteal region. And so some of those things I'm not going to repeat because they were relevant, the gluteal region they may not be necessarily relevant in the posterior thigh. Again, I'll not talk much about the parts of the pelvic bone that are relevant for the other parts of the thigh. I'll only focus on the ones that are relevant for posterior thigh. So yes, this is the iliac crest, as you already know. And there's something along the iliac crest, slightly lateral there, which is called the iliac tubercle. This is the ischial tuberosity. Remember, tuberosity is a projection or a prominence of a bone. So if this is the ischium, this is the ischial tuberosity, very important surface landmark in the posterior thigh. This is the spine of ischium or the ischial spine. Remember, spine is a sharp projection from a bone. This is the ischial pubic ramus. The ischiopubic ramus is formed by the ramus of ischium, which is this one, and the inferior pubic ramus, which is that one. The two are united at this point. And so the whole extent is what we call the ischiopubic ramus. 
with the presence of the ischial spine, we know that this is the greater sciatic notch and this is the lesser sciatic notch. You'll remember that these sciatic notches are the ones which are converted into foramina when you introduce some ligaments. The foramina will be the greater sciatic foramen and the lesser sciatic foramen. And the foramina, the ligaments are the sacrotuberous ligament from the sacrum to the ischial tuberosity and sacrospinous ligament from the sacrum to the ischial spine. So this becomes a greater sciatic foramen. This is a lesser sciatic foramen. Remember that the greater sciatic foramen traverses a number of neurovascular structures which go to the gluteal region and some of those could extend to the thigh and especially posterior thigh, like the sciatic nerve and the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh. Of course, that the sacrum and that the coccyx, which are also important surface landmarks in the posterior thigh. In this image, we see it better that the back of sacrum and that's the tip of coccyx. This is the sacrotuberous ligament, that sacrospinous ligament. So that is with regard to the pelvic bone. How about with regard to the femur? So this is a femur, this is the head of femur, neck, greater trochanter, or that is the greater trochanter, that's the lesser trochanter. So here we are seeing at femur from anterior view, and this is from the posterior view. Posteriorly, there's a ridge that extends on the posterior shaft of femur, which we call the linear aspera. This linear aspera has two lips, the lateral lip, extends superiorly to the gluteal tuberosity. Remember that is the inferior attachment of the gluteus maximus. But inferiorly, the lateral lip extends to the lateral supracondylar ridge, which is this one. The medial lip of the linear aspera superiorly continues as what you call the spiral line, which appears to continue with the intertrochanteric line. The intertrochanteric line is the line between the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter anteriorly. A similar line posteriorly is much prominent and is called the intertrochanteric crest. So this is the intertrochanteric crest. A similar thing anteriorly is called the intertrochanteric line. Extending from the lesser trochanter slightly inferiorly is the pectineal line, which is that one. That's the pectineal line. Okay, down here, the medial lip of the linear aspera continues as a medial supracondylar ridge. Now, these are the condyles of femur. We have the medial condyle because of that. So we know this is the medial condyle. And this is the lateral condyle. A condyle is the rounded end of a bone. So these are the condyles of femur. And between the two condyles is a notch, which we call the intercondylar notch. Between the, the medial and the lateral supracondylar ridges of the femur, we have that surface of femur, which we call the popliteal surface of femur. The condyles of femur are the ones that will articulate at the knee joint. Radiologically, this is how the femur looks like. So there's a head, neck, greater trochanter, lesser trochanter. We can appreciate that the femur has a medullary cavity within it and that, that cortical bone. Distally, we can also see that and as well as the condyles as well of the femur. That's the knee joint. And similarly, we have what we call condyles of tibia. These are the tibial condyles and that is the fibula. So our discussion of the popliteal fossa will revolve around this region. That's why I've mentioned something about the bones of the leg as well. Let's go to our second agenda, talking about sensory innovation of the skin of the posterior thigh. So if you focus on the skin of the posterior thigh, we perhaps pay attention to the, mid, the second image there. 
There's one nerve which supplies the skin of the posterior thigh, one prominent nerve. We call it the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh. This posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh is one of the nerves that pass below piriformis within the greater sciatic foramen together with the sciatic nerve, they run together or side by side. The nerve is unique in the sense that although it's a cutaneous nerve, usually it turns deep to the deep fascia of the thigh, but gives you branches which perforate it to supply the skin. The termination of the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh is on the skin over the popliteal fossa, that region there. That's where the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh terminates. The root values of this nerve is S123. And so we'd expect the dermatome of the posterior thigh also to follow that kind of anatomy, S123. So at your own time, you can check therefore which part of the posterior thigh is S1, which part is S2, and which part is S3. Having said so, we can now talk about the three osteofascial compartments of the thigh, how they are formed, and we'll also then focus on the contents of the posterior thigh compartment, which is our main subject matter. Now, before we understand how they are formed, it is important that you know that the thigh has a deep fascia. The deep fascia of the thigh is known as fascia lata. This deep fascia of the thigh is illustrated in this particular image. If these are cross sections, so this is skin. And below that, that yellow region is the subcutaneous tissue, which largely contains fat. That's why it's illustrated with yellow, with some subcutaneous, or let me say superficial veins, which usually run within that fatty layer, like that example is one of them. Now, deep to that fatty superficial layer, or subcutaneous tissue, we have the deep fascia of the thigh, which we call the fascia lata. So in cross-section, that is the fascia lata. We'll talk more about the fascia lata when we look at the anterior medial thigh in the next lecture. But for now, I want you to know the following, that fascia lata has some septa that enter from it all the way to the linear aspera of the femur. These septa are termed the intermuscular septa because they're between muscles. The intermuscular septa that the fascia lata sends in therefore divides the thigh into three anatomical compartments. We have one posterior to the Femurs, that means on the posterior spiral thigh, we correctly call it the posterior muscular compartment. It is also called the flexor compartment of the thigh, and I'll tell you why. Then we have the anterior compartment, which is the largest compartment with many muscles. So this basically means the muscles in front of your thigh. The anterior muscular compartment it's also called the extensor compartment of the thigh. Lastly, we have the medial compartment of the thigh. The medial compartment of the thigh means the muscles in the medial aspect of your thigh. These muscles are also called the adductor compartment. This compartment is also called the adductor compartment of the thigh. So we'll see why they're given those function names, flexor, extensor, and adductor compartment. But at least by now, you understand where they're being given the anatomical names, posterior, anterior, and medial muscular compartment. So in this particular lecture, our intention is to talk about the posterior muscular compartment. Then in the next lecture, we'll talk about the anterior and the medial muscular compartment. We commonly just call it the anteromedial compartment. So let's focus on the posterior compartment, the one shaded in blue. So these are the muscles in the posterior thigh. We call it the flexor compartment 
because of the action these muscles have on the knee joint. These muscles usually flex the knee. And you can try to imagine that if you have a muscle in the posterior thigh, it contracts and it's inserted into the bones of the leg. How will this muscle move your knee joint? The leg will move posteriorly, and that means flexion of the knee. So they flex the knee, and that's why they're called the flexor compartment. There are three major muscles in this particular compartment, but there's another one that is in a gray zone, partly in the posterior compartment and partly in the medial compartment. I'll talk about it. The three major muscles are these ones. We have the biceps femoris, called so because it has two heads, the long head of biceps femoris and the short head of biceps femoris. They are called so accordingly based on the length of those heads. Then we have what we call semitendinosus, called so because the muscle has a long tendon. The tendon is not necessarily half of the whole muscle, but the tendon is significantly long. That tendon is, an is at the level of the insertion of the muscle. So semitendinosus has a long tendinous insertion. Then we have semimembranosus, called so because there's a part of a muscle, of this muscle that is membranous. Again, it's not that the, it's a half of it that's membranous, not quite. It's actually a small part that is membranous. But uniquely, semimembranosus, the membrane is at the origin, not at the insertion like semitendinosus. So semimembranosus has a membranous origin, a small membranous origin. Semitendinosus has a prominent tendinous insertion. And the biceps femoris has two heads, long and short head. These are the major muscles which are found in the posterior thigh. These muscles do the following. They cause flexion at the knee. So they flex the leg at the knee joint. But they extend the thigh at the hip joint. That's the action. In terms of their nerve supply, they are supplied by the branches of the sciatic nerve. So sciatic nerve, remember, it's one sheet of nerve with two major nerves within it, the tibial division and the common peroneal division. So those two divisions of the sciatic nerve are the ones that supply the muscles of the posterior thigh. This image captures for you the sciatic nerve, but we'll talk about it shortly and the fact that it runs in the posterior thigh, and so we'll expect it to be the one supplying the mass of the posterior thigh. Also next to the sciatic nerve, you can see the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh that supply the skin of the back of the thigh. Which blood vessels go to the posterior thigh? The posterior thigh receives branches of arteries which penetrate through another muscle called adductor magnus, those branches penetrate the ductor magnus to reach the posterior thigh. The point is this, we don't have a large artery that runs in the posterior thigh. So the posterior thigh musculature rely on the artery that are in the anterior compartment, the arteries in the anterior compartment, giving it branches. Those branches go through another muscle to reach the posterior thigh. So because they go through the muscle adductor magnus, we call those branches the perforating branches. Usually there are four. We call them first, second, third, and perforating arteries of the profunda femoris. So profunda femoris is the artery in the other compartment of the thigh, which gives branches which perforate adductor magnus to reach the posterior muscular compartment. When we discuss the muscles of the posterior thigh, you'll come across the term, the hamstring muscles. The hamstring unit of muscles consists of some muscles with some specific 
characteristics. Let's outline the characteristics. The hamstring group of muscles have a common origin. And that common origin is the ischial tuberosity. They all arise from the ischial tuberosity. We can also argue and say that they have a common insertion, but you have to qualify that. We qualify it by saying that the common insertion is that they all insert in the bones of the leg. So we've qualified. But usually that's not a very uh, strict rule for it because you realize that uh, there are two bones of the leg, tibia and fibula. So there's one that go to tibia, well, two go to tibia, that is semitendinosus and semimembranosus. Biceps femoris goes to fibula. Anyway, they're all bones of the leg. Having said so, it means that the hamstring group of muscles cross two joints. And you can add that as another characteristic. They cross both the hip joint as well as the knee joint. They cross those joints. And tailored to that, then we can say the other characteristic is that they have a common action. They all extend the hip joint and flex the knee joint. Last but not least, the hamstring group of muscles have a common innervation. And the nerve supply to the muscle unit called hamstring is a tibial division of the sciatic nerve. They all supply the tibial division of the sciatic nerve. Now with that in mind, we can come back to our concept. We say that we have semitendinosus, semimembranosus, and long head, sorry, and biceps femoris. Out of those three, the biceps femoris is a unique one because it has two heads, the long head and the short head. With the characteristics I've given, we realize that only the long head of biceps femoris qualifies to be called a hamstring muscle. In other words, I'm saying that the short head of biceps femoris is not a hamstring muscle, even though the long head of biceps femoris is a hamstring muscle. So understand that very well. Components of the hamstring group of muscles therefore be semitendinosus, semimembranosus, and the long head of biceps femoris muscle. There are reasons why the short head is not a hamstring. One, it does not arise from the issue tuberosity. And that means it does not act therefore on the hip joint because this muscle arises from the shaft of femur. So it doesn't cross the hip joint, therefore it cannot act on it, it cannot extend it. The other thing is that short head versus femoris is the one supplied by the common peroneal division of the sciatic nerve. So it's not innervated by the tibial division of sciatic. Therefore, it's not a hamstring. However, when we discuss hamstring group of muscles, there's another muscle that we can still add into the list of three. And that is what we call the hamstring part of the adductor magnus. Now, something you need to understand, adductor magnus is a big muscle in the medial compartment, even the name suggests so. This big muscle has an extensive origin and it also has some, du it has dual innervation and it has multiple actions. Now, among them, there's a part of the adductor magnus muscle that actually originates from the issue tuberosity, just like the rest of the hamstring muscles. That part of the adductor magnus that arises from the issue tuberosity also is innervated by the tibial division of the sciatic nerve. 
It is for that reason, therefore, that we can include adductor magnus, the hamstring part, or what we call the tendinous part. So the tendinous part or the hamstring part of the adductor magnus is considered part of the hamstring unit. However, there's another part of the adductor magnus which is not part of the hamstring. We call it the aponeurotic part or the, the adductor part. That part is not considered a hamstring for some reasons. We will see why when you look at the anterior medial thigh. So I hope you've understood that there are three major components of the hamstring unit, but we can add one to become four, and that one is not the short head of biceps. Now, having talked about the posterior muscular compartments and the structures found within there, we can now look at the major neurovascular structures which are within the posterior muscular compartment. So we look at the nerve and the arteries at greater detail. Let's start with the nerve. The main nerve of the posterior compartment is the sciatic nerve. So in this lecture, let's talk about sciatic nerve with a lot of clarity and to completion. Sciatic nerve originates from the lumbosacral plexus, among other nerves which also supply the lower limb. The root value of the sciatic nerve is L45 S123. By now you understand what root value means. If you've forgotten, remember we talked about in the previous class when we talked about gluteal region. What's the cause of the sciatic nerve? When we talk about cause, we refer to the path the nerve follows. So once the sciatic nerve is formed within the pelvic cavity, it will pass through the infrapiriformic compartment of the greater sciatic foramen. After it passes through the infrapiriformic compartment of the greater sciatic foramen, it will enter the gluteal region. So here we are seeing it as it enters the gluteal region through the infrapiriformic compartment of the greater sciatic foramen. Remember, the greater sciatic notch is divided into foramina by the presence of the ligament. Once it has entered the gluteal region, how does it proceed? The nerve will pass deep to gluteus maximus muscle. That's the one that has been cut here. So it is just deep to the gluteus maximus muscle. And as we can see, it's running together the posterior kidneys now of the time. However, even though it's deep to the gluteus maximus muscle, and we can say here it is also inferior to the piriformis muscle, piriformis being one of the small lateral tetras, the nerve is posterior to the other five small lateral tetras of the hip. So we're talking about superior gamelas, obturator internus, inferior gamelas, quadratus femoris, and obturator externus. The nerve is posterior to the other five small lateral tetras. In addition to that, the nerve is also posterior to the hip joint. Look at that anatomy there. The hip joint just there. So the nerve is just behind the hip joint. The nerve exits the gluteal region, somewhere midpoint between the greater tocanta and ischiotuberosity, roughly at the midpoint there, that's where it exits. And so that becomes its landmark actually. If you are to trace the anatomical landmark of the static nerve within the gluteal region, you put that surface landmark, their midpoint between ischiotuberosity and the greater tocanta, and a midpoint between posterior spirillex spine and uh, cossix there that is corresponding with the infrapiriformic compartment. So you join the two points with an imaginary line. The only thing you need to remember is that that imaginary line is convex laterally. So it's not a straight line, but convex laterally. 
that's the landmark, the surface landmark of the static nerve within the gluteal region. How about within the posterior thigh? So the nerve enters the thigh, and in particular, it enters the posterior thigh. It runs vertically within the posterior thigh, deep to the hamstring muscles, and especially deep to the long head of biceps femoris, as we can see in this particular image. After that, the nerve will go all the way to the apex of what you call the popliteal fossa. And that is where the nerve terminates. Usually the nerve will terminate by splitting into the two components, the tibial division going, continuing straight through the popliteal fossa and the common perineal division goes laterally along the margin of the biceps femoris. At this point, the biceps femoris heads are already united, short head and long head are already united. So common perineal nerve division goes slightly lateral to that. Tibial division goes straight. Those are the two terminal divisions. So if you are to trace the surface landmark of the sciatic nerve within the posterior thigh, then we join that first point, greater trochanter, issue to be rusty midpoint. That's one point. And then the apex of the popliteal fossa. The apex of the popliteal fossa being where the tendons of semitendinosa, semimelinosa meet with that of the biceps. So an imaginary line joining those two will represent the location of the sciatic nerve the tracing of the sciatic nerve. That the cause of the sciatic nerve, what about the blood supply to this particular nerve? As I told you earlier in the gluteal region that the sciatic nerve has blood vessels supplying because a big nerve, it's the largest nerve in the body. The sciatic nerve receives arterial blood supply in the gluteal region as well as in the back of the thigh. In the gluteal region, the artery that supplies for the companion artery, it's a branch of the inferior gluteal artery. Within the back of the thigh, the sciatic nerve receives blood supply from the longitudinal anastomosis. The longitudinal anastomosis is the anastomosis formed by the perforating arteries, which come from the profunda femoris artery that supply the posterior thigh. In this image, you can see them. Those are the perforating arteries. So the anastomos they form the one that supply the sciatic nerve. What are the distribution of the sciatic nerve? The tibial division of the sciatic nerve. Remember I told that sciatic nerve is just two nerves within one common shape. So we have the tibial division and the common perineal division. The tibial division, as I've already mentioned, supply the hamstring group of muscles. And now we can say, including the adductor magnus, because I qualified for you that the adductor magnus has a hamstring part. The common perineal division supplies the short head of the biceps femoris muscle. So there are muscular branches which come from the common perineal nerve, which go to the short head of the biceps. Similarly, there are muscular branches which come from the tibial nerve, which join, which go to the hamstring group of muscles, even though the sciatic nerve may still be just in one common shape. The two terminal branches will continue into the popliteal fossa and will give you other branches as they go along, all the way in the leg and the foot. We will talk more about those nerves at their respective times. For now, we'll end the story of the static nerve at that point. But remember, even wherever they are going, they're still supplying the lower limb, and eventually they are still coming from static nerve. That means if you eat your static nerve 
proximally, all those structures, including the territory of tibial and common peroneal, will be affected. We talked more about the clinical anatomy, the sciatic nerve in the gluteal region. We don't have to repeat much of that. But just common things to remember. Remember, we said that the two divisions may split sometimes in the pelvis. With that in mind, if that happens, the common perineal division may go through piriformis, and so we may have entrapment of piriformis of the common perineal nerve within piriformis, giving a syndrome we call piriformis syndrome. You can check on what piriformis syndrome is all about. Also, if you give injections in the gluteal region, sometimes you may have the injection inadvertently injuring the sciatic nerve. And so you'll also get symptomatology related to sciatic nerve injury in that sense. Great. Having talked about sciatic nerve, we can now talk about the arteries that we expect the posterior thigh. So this one I have to give you perspective first. We'll talk more about the arterial tree of the thigh in the anterior medial thigh. But in a nutshell, there's an artery that is in the pelvis that we call external iliac artery. When it enters the thigh, we call it common femoral artery. This common femoral artery divides into two major branches. We have the superficial femoral artery, which largely goes through the thigh and supplies very few structures, and then will pass behind the knee joint as the popliteal artery. But there's another branch of the common femoral artery that we call the profunda femoris artery. The term profunda here means deep. So the deep femoral artery is the main artery that supplies the muscles of the thigh. It's the one that gives several branches in the thigh to supply it. Among those several branches that profunda femoris artery gives are the arteries that go through the adductor magnus muscle, perforating it to reach the posterior compartment. And so those are the ones we call the perforating arteries. And so the posterior thigh is supplied by perforating arteries of the profunda femoris artery. These perforating arteries, when they reach the posterior thigh, they also try to connect with it themselves. The branch, the term, their branches connect to form what we now call the longitudinal anastomosis. So we have longitudinal anastomosis within the posterior thigh. In addition to that, uh, remember there was cruciate anastomosis, which was also formed by many arteries, including one of the branch of the first perforating artery. Right, now we can finish with the popliteal fossa. We look at the boundaries, contents, and clinical relevance of the popliteal fossa. I've already told you the location from behind the knee joint. So it's a diamond shaped space. The diamond is roughly this way found behind the knee joint. It's a potential space that carry a number of things. But before we look at the content, let's look at the boundaries. Having said that diamond set space, we can divide the walls as being four. And from this anatomy, we can see that we can talk about superomedial, superolateral, inferolateral, and inferomedial wall. The Superomedial wall, demarcated by that black line there, is formed by two muscles, semitendinosus and semimembranosus. The superolateral wall is formed by the biceps femoris muscle. At this point, the two heads have already united. So that superolateral wall, this is superomedial wall. The inferomedial wall is formed by the medial head of the gastrocnemius muscle. So let me just mention that we have some muscles called gastrocnemius. We'll talk more about them when we look at the leg, but they arise from the condyles of the femur. Having 
come from the condyles of the femur. We have one from the medial condyle and another from the lateral condyle. So we talk of the medial belly or head and the lateral belly or head of gastrocnemius. The medial belly will form the inferior medial wall and the lateral belly will form the inferior lateral wall of the popliteal fossa. So those are the walls. But remember, this is a 3D potential space. So other than having the walls, it will also have a roof and a floor. Let's start with the roof. So the roof basically is what covers it or what you can forcefully call the posterior wall. So the posterior wall from anatomical position, the posterior wall is the roof or we can say superficially. We have the popliteal fascia. The popliteal fascia is the extension of the deep fascia, the thigh, the fascia latter over the popliteal fossa. So it's just the extension of the fascia latter over the popliteal fossa. Although it extends there, there are some super, superficial structures which are on that roof. They are found on the subcutaneous tissue of the popliteal fascia. We can mention them. We have a vein, which we call the small saphenous vein. The small saphenous vein is a superficial vein. It runs on the lateral aspect to the foot. That's where it begins. Remember, it's a vein, so they begin peripherally. Then it goes to the posterior lateral aspect of the ankle and posterior lateral aspect of the calf, then go to the posterior calf and pierce the popliteal fascia to enter into a vein within the popliteal fossa, which we call the popliteal vein. So while the vein is traversing there, it's partly passing the roof of the popliteal fossa, we call the small saphenous vein. Remember it's a lateral one, so starting from the lateral margin of the foot. That vein usually is accompanied by superficial lymphatics as well, and the superficial lymphatics that accompany it will also drain into the lymph nodes within the popliteal fossa, which we call popliteal lymph nodes. We have the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh as another structure found on the roof there. The posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh terminates at the roof of the popliteal fossa. So the terminal branches of the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh are the ones found at the roof. Then there's a nerve called the serial nerve. Serial nerve is a cutaneous branch that is given from the tibial nerve within the popliteal fossa. So that nerve may sometimes pierce the roof of this particular space, the serial nerve, but sometimes may not pierce. Well, I'll talk more about serial nerve and uh, something called serial communicating nerve, which is from the common peroneal nerve later. Now we can talk about the floor of the popliteal fossa. The floor of the popliteal fossa is best described when you look at it from above downwards. We'll use this image to help us understand the floor of the popliteal fossa. So if these are the middle and the lateral supracondylar ridges of femur, this is the popliteal surface of femur. From above downwards, the floor of the popliteal fossa is formed by the popliteal surface of femur. So there, that is part of the floor. That floor is usually, at that region, there's a lot of fat tissue present there. So some people talk about the fat that covers the popliteal surface of femur. But you can argue that the fat is actually a content, not a boundary. So you are safer talking about popliteal surface of femur. Going inferiorly, 
we see the capsule of the knee joint. So this is the posterior capsule of the knee joint, also forming part of the floor. The posterior capsule of the knee joint is usually reinforced by another ligament, which we call the oblique popliteal ligament. The oblique popliteal ligament is an extension of the insertion of semimembranosus muscle. When semimembranosus comes and inserts somewhere there on the tibia, there's an expansion that it gives obliquely over the capsule of the knee to reinforce it posteriorly. That oblique reinforcement of the capsule is what we call the oblique popliteal ligament. And so it's part of the floor as well. Going down, we have a muscle called popliteus. This popliteus muscle has an important role in the knee joint, talk about it when we discuss the knee. But there's a capsule that usually covers it, or rather fascia that usually covers it. So we can just call it the fascia of a popliteus muscle. So that fascia forms the floor of the popliteal fossa inferiorly. Those are the structures in the floor of the popliteal fossa. Now we can talk about the contents. What does the space contain? As we've already mentioned, it contains the terminal branches of the sciatic nerve. Those terminal branches are the tibial nerve and the common perineal nerve. Other than that, they also contain some branches of those nerves. We can start with the branches of the common perineal nerve within the popliteal fossa. So this is a common perineal nerve. It takes a lateral tangent to exit the fossa somewhere there. But when it is in the fossa, it gives us some branches. First, remember before it entered the fossa, it gave you, it gave you a muscular branch to the short head of biceps. That one is given before the fossa. Now within the fossa, common perineal nerve gives you articular branches, which means branches which go to the knee joint in this case. We call them genicular branches. We have what you call superior lateral genicular nerve given on the upper part. And we have inferior lateral genicular nerve given on the lower part. Take note that they're all lateral, superior lateral and inferior lateral genicular nerves. Those are articular branches of common perineal nerve given within the popliteal fossa to the knee joint. Apart from the articular branches, we also have cutaneous branches. Cutaneous branches are branches which go to the skin. We can mention two as well. There's what we call the lateral cutaneous nerve of the calf, this one here, the lateral cutaneous nerve of the calf. So it's applied the skin of the lateral calf. Apart from that, we also have another branch which we call the serial communicating nerve. The serial communicating nerve is a branch of the common perineal nerve that joins the serial nerve serial nerve being a branch of the tibial nerve. So we have serial communicating from common perineal nerve, which is this one, joining the serial nerve not shown in this particular image. So that is a cutaneous branch. Now there's a different naming system that sometimes can be used to name the serial nerve. We can argue that the one that come from tibial nerve be called the medial serial nerve. In that case, the one that comes from common peroneal nerve is called the lateral serial nerve, and the two then joint form serial nerve. There's that naming system that can be used. But you can also use the naming system of tibial nerve giving you serial nerve and common peroneal nerve giving you serial communicating. So the serial communicating nerve is also called the lateral serial nerve in another nomenclature. Great, so those are branches of the common perineal nerve. How about branch of the tibial nerve? 
tibial nerve also gives you branches within the popliteal fossa, other than the branches that it gave to the hamstrings before the popliteal fossa. So the branches given by the tibial nerve here will also be classified as articular, cutaneous, but now here we'll also have muscular branches. The articular branches of the tibial nerve are the ones which go to the knee joint. We therefore call them genicular nerves. We have superior medial genicular nerve. We have middle genicular nerve. And we have inferior medial genicular nerve. So they are named according to how they are given. And they also correspond with the branches of the popliteal artery that also go to the knee. Superior medial, middle, and inferior medial genicular nerves. Take note that the ones given from the tibial are with M. So either medial or middle. The ones given by common peroneal nerve were lateral. We have a total of five genicular nerves superior lateral and superior medial genicular nerves, middle genicular nerve, superior, sorry, inferior lateral and inferior medial genicular nerves. So a total of five, two of them from common peroneal, three of them from tibial nerve. Apart from the genicular nerves, the tibial nerve gives you a cutaneous nerve, which is the serial nerve, or you can call it the medial serial nerve. I've already clarified on that nomenclature. That serial nerve goes down posteriorly on the leg, and then at the ankle joint, it runs laterally to supply the lateral aspect of the ankle as well as the margin of the foot. Then we have the muscular branch of the tibial nerve. Muscular branch of the tibial nerve go to the gastrocnemius muscles also go to the plantaris muscle, which is found within the popliteal fossa, also goes to popliteus muscle. Those ones are branches of the tibial nerve given within the popliteal fossa. Apart from the branch of the static nerve, we also have the popliteal artery and its branches. The next slide will talk more about the popliteal artery. And so let me not mention much about it at this point. But this is the artery, that's the popliteal artery. It is the most anterior structure within the popliteal fossa. If you have to look at the neurovascular structure, it's the most anterior neurovascular structure. I'm saying the most anterior, and that means therefore that it's the deepest neurovascular structure within the popliteal fossa. That has some clinical implication as you're going to see. The order in which the structures are is usually the artery, then on top of it, the popliteal vein, and above that, the tibial nerve. Remember, the common peroneal nerve takes a lateral tangent. We have popliteal vein and its tributaries. The tributaries of the popliteal vein will follow the, the branches of the popliteal artery anyway. However, there's one tributary which will not have a corresponding artery or may not have a corresponding artery that the small saphenous vein. So the small saphenous vein terminates into the popliteal vein, which means that there is a terminal part of the small saphenous vein. It's a content of the popliteal fossa after it has pierced the roof. This shows you the small saphenous vein as it terminates into the popliteal fossa, piercing the roof to join the popliteal vein. We have popliteal fat. There's a lot of fatty tissue within the popliteal fossa indeed. And within that fat, we have also popliteal lymph nodes. Great, so those are the contents of the popliteal fossa. Now let's talk about the clinical relevance of the popliteal fossa. There's something called Intermittent claudication. Intermittent claudication is where somebody feels pain when is walking or 
feeling, doing some activity, especially in the calf. And when the person is at rest, the pain does not, is not there. That's what we call intermittent claudication. So pain is the experience when performing some physical activity and at rest, the pain regresses. Usually this is partly caused by inadequate blood supply to a particular region and especially in this case to muscles. So when there is activity, the oxygen demand for these muscles is high and the artery may not meet that demand, so this pain. But at rest, there's no increased demand. And for that reason, the insufficient supply is adequate. This would happen if there is something that is perhaps partially occluding the popliteal artery. And so it does not supply enough blood to the calf musculature, the muscles of the leg. It could be maybe that it's partially blocked by fat tissue within it or something kinking the artery. But that is very common with the popliteal artery. There are also some swellings that usually are experienced within the popliteal fossa. Swellings within the popliteal fossa can be due to many things. It could be that the popliteal artery itself has a weak wall and so it's ballooned out. Ballooning of artery is called aneurysm. Or it could be the fat within the fossa that has become a tumor. Benign tumors from fat is called lymphoma. It could be the lymph nodes which are swollen. And lymph nodes will swell if there is some infection in the territory in which they drain. So swelling of popliteal lymph nodes would be alluding to a possible infection on the lateral margin of the foot because that's the territory drained by the popliteal lymph nodes. The popliteal lymph nodes drain the lymph in the popliteal fossa, it could be Baker cyst. Baker cyst is the popping of the synovial membrane of the knee joint through some bursae around the ankle, sorry, around the, the popliteal fossa. So basically it's protrusion of the synovial membrane of the knee joint through the popliteal fossa. It's called Baker cyst. So that's an example of a swelling within the popliteal fossa that could be due to any of those things I've mentioned. Lastly, I want to talk about supracondylar femoral fractures. When you have a supracondylar femoral fracture, like the one shown in this particular radiograph, it means that uh, there's a fracture above the condyles of femur. When you have a supracondylar femoral fracture, the distal fragment of the femur usually may go posteriorly because of the pool of gastrocnemius muscles. And that means that the proximal fragment goes anteriorly as we can see in this particular image. When this happens, there's a high risk of injury to the structures within the popliteal fossa and especially high risk of injury to the popliteal artery. Now, why popliteal artery? Because popliteal artery is the most anterior structure. And so it's the one that is actually resting on the floor of the popliteal fossa is the structure that's most at risk of injury in supracondylar femoral fractures. The other reason why it would be injured mainly is because it gives several branches within the popliteal fossa which anchor it and so it's not very mobile. The other thing is that it's kind of fixed within its origin and termination and so the artery is not very flexible 
It's not very mobile within the flow sand. So any traumatic disturbance in form of dislocation is likely to injure the popliteal artery. Having said so, let's now finish with the popliteal artery. So the popliteal artery is a main artery within the popliteal fossa. It is a continuation of the superficial femoral artery. This is the popliteal artery. It's a continuation of the superficial femoral artery. Let me just remind you about that and mention it earlier. I tell you that we have a common femoral artery that divides into deep femoral, giving us branches with thigh and superficial femoral that largely passes through the thigh. So this superficial femoral is the one that beyond the thigh goes behind the knee into the popliteal fossa, therefore changing name from superficial femoral artery to popliteal artery. So what are the extents of the popliteal artery? When the superficial femoral artery leaves the thigh to enter the popliteal fossa, it passes through a hole within the adductor magnus. That hole, that opening within the adductor magnus is called the adductor hiatus. And so the superior extent of the popliteal artery is the adductor hiatus. The inferior extent of the popliteal artery is what we call the soleal arc. Now, this muscle here is called the soleus. It has a fibrous arc of origin at around that point, what we call the soleal arc. And th that marks the lower end of the popliteal artery. That lower end of the popliteal artery also corresponds to the lower border of the muscle popliteus, which is this one here. And at that point, it also corresponds where the artery actually terminates by dividing into two branches. And so you can still use the branching as the end of the popliteal artery, but we need some surface landmarks. So it could be the lower border of popliteus muscle or the cellular arc. What are the branches of the popliteal artery? It has many branches. We can categorize them into these three for the sake of description. There are those that we are calling articular branches. The articular branches are the branch which are given to supply the structures around the knee joint. Most of these arteries will contribute to what we call the genicular anastomosis. We'll talk about genicular anastomosis at great length when we discuss the anatomy of the knee. The genicular arteries correspond with the genicular nerves that we already mentioned. So we have superior lateral genicular artery, superior, this is superior medial genicular artery, sorry. Then we have superior lateral genicular artery. We have the inferior lateral genicular artery. We have the inferior middle genicular artery and you have middle genicular arteries. So those makes them five, although the middle genicular arteries are usually two. So sometimes you can argue that the genicular arteries are six. Out of those five or six, the middle genicular arteries are the ones that supply the intraarticular structures. These are the four supply the extraarticular structures and the ones that contribute to the genicular anastomosis that we'll discuss. Apart from genicular branches, so sorry, remember that those genicular branches of the femoral, of the popliteal artery are accompanied with the veins as well, with the same name that will join the popliteal vein. They're also accompanied with nerves, the genicular nerves. They may not run to get the nerve per se, but similar names are given for the nerves as well. But for the nerves, remember the ones for lateral are from common peroneal and the ones with M from tibial. Then we have muscular branches of the popliteal artery. The muscular branch of the popliteal artery will supply the musculature. 
basically around so that those that are given to Hopletius, that those that are given to Solius, that those that are given to Gastrocnemius. In particular, the ones which are given to Gastrocnemius have names. They are called serial arteries. Serial arteries are the muscular branches of popliteal artery that goes to gastrocnemius mass. So we'll also expect them to be two, one to the medial head and another one to the lateral head. Then we have the terminal branches of the popliteal artery. The terminal branches are the ones which are given last. So the popliteal artery divides, terminates by dividing into two. The anterior tibial artery and the posterior tibial artery. The anterior tibial artery goes to the anterior compartment of the leg. The posterior tibial artery goes to the posterior compartment of the leg. They are separated by the interosseous membrane that runs between the tibia and fibula. We'll talk more about them in the leg. So that is the description of the branches of the popliteal artery. Some key relations of the popliteal artery as we finish. Anteriorly, remember the structure and the flow of the popliteal fossa are the anterior relations. So we'll have the popliteal surface of femur, although I told you that there'll be fat there separating it from the femur itself. Then we have the capsule of posterior capsule of the knee joint and we have the fascia of a popliteus muscle. So those ones are anterior to the artery. And posteriorly, we have the tibial nerve being very superficial, then the popliteal vein next to that, then the artery in that order. So the tibial nerve is usually more superficial followed by popliteal vein and the artery is the deepest structure. But apart from popliteal vein and tibial nerve, the other posterior structures would be the semimembranosus muscle and plantaris muscle, which would also be at some point deep, sorry, posterior to the artery, which means that the artery is deep to those structures. In this image, you can see the semimembranosus. Remember the artery will be coming from the middle aspect here. So proximally, semimembranosus is posterior to the artery as we start. Right, so that is it. That is the relational anatomy of the popliteal artery, and that summarizes the story of the popliteal artery, as well as this particular story that we're discussing. We're looking at the posterior thigh and the popliteal fossa. So we'll stop there. Thank you very much. The next lecture will still be on the thigh. That will be part two. Now focusing on the anteromedial thigh.